Designing Uber is one of the more challenging system design interview questions because it's easy to become overwhelmed by the multitude of components and over-engineer the solution. In this system design, we will focus on the core flows that most interviewers expect to see covers, as well as provide deep dives into the most critical aspects of the system. So let's jump in. So for the functional requirements, we'll want a ride request. So riders should be able to input their pickup and destination location, view nearby drivers and receive real time fare estimates. There should also be ride matching. So the system should be able to efficiently match a rider with an available driver that meets their requirements. There should be driver tracking. So once matched, the rider should be able to track the driver's location in real time, along with the estimated time of arrival. And the system should also support push notifications for things like ride updates, driver arrival, trip completion, promotions, etc. And for the non-functional requirements, we want scalability. So the platform should be able to support you know, more than 100 million daily active users, and it should be able to scale effectively and be able to handle regional spikes in demand. There should also be high availability, and it should be available 24 seven, ensuring minimal downtime as the switching cost for users is extremely low. And then finally, we'll want low latency though, as the application must perform well, even in areas with poor cellular networks, because we always wanna provide fast and responsive user interactions to ensure a smooth experience globally. What's not covered is ride pooling. So the implementation of ride pooling services where multiple passengers share a ride will not be covered here. So looking at the data model, we've got our riders table. So this simply stores information about individuals requesting rides. We've got the drivers table, which again will store details about drivers in the system. We'll have vehicles, which tracks vehicles that are associated with, with drivers. We'll have fares. So these store information about fare options that are presented to a user. So we can have the base fare. So this is the initial cost of a ride before any additional charges are applied. And then we can also have maybe a surge multiplier. So this is a dynamic multiplier applied during periods of high demand or low driver availability and this increases the fare to encourage more drivers to become available. We'll also have rides. So these store information about rides initiated by riders. So I'll have a start time and end time, and then I'll also have a status. So this could be requested, accepted, completed, or canceled. And then finally, we'll also have payments. So this handles all the payment details for completed rides. So it'll also have a status indicating is it pending, completed, or failed. And so for a ride sharing service like Uber, I think using a classic kind of RESTful API to interact with the data would work fine. RESTful APIs, they're simple, widely used, stateless, and support caching, which makes it a good candidate for our system. And so our REST API will comprise of three main endpoints. The first will be a post to the API fares estimate endpoint. And so this will provide fare estimates based on the rider's pickup and destination locations. And the parameters it will have will include the pickup location, which will be a latitude longitude pair, and same for the destination location. And obviously the rider ID will be included in the JSON web token, uh, which is what this system will be using for authentication. The second endpoint will be a post endpoint to the API rides request, and this will allow a rider to request a ride by selecting a fare. And so the parameter it would take would be the fare ID, which would identify which fare the rider has selected. And then the final endpoint will be a put to the API rides ride ID accept endpoint and this will allow a driver to accept a ride and so these are just three of the kind of core endpoints obviously in a production system there'd be a lot more and same with the data model there'd be a lot more tables but obviously due to the time constraints in an interview this is a pretty standard of what you should be expected to cover okay and so what we're going to do now is look at the two main flows so driver location update flow and a ride request flow and by the time we've walked through those you'll have a really good idea of what the entire system looks like, as well as how all the components work together. So looking at the driver location update flow, the first thing we have to look at here is we know we have to periodically send updates from the driver's location, which then need to be stored and then occasionally sent to a rider that they have connected with. And so there are many ways to solve this. And so the ways we're going to quickly look at are long polling, service end events, WebSocket, and Quick. So looking at long polling, how it works, the client repeatedly requests the server for updates, but the server holds that connection until new data is available. And then it will simply repeat that process continuously. So the pros is it's very simple to implement and works well over traditional HTTP. However, the cons is it's a very high server load due to repeated requests, especially when there are no updates and it can be a lot higher latency than something like WebSockets. And so it's best for simple scenarios where real time updates aren't crucial or if WebSocket support is limited. Then for server sent events, it works by having the server send updates to the client over a single persistent HTTP connection. 
For the pros, it's simple to implement for one-way communication, in this case, server to client, and it uses fewer resources than WebSockets for simple data streams. However, the cons include one-way communication only. The client cannot send data to the server over the same connection. And so this is best for streaming updates like ride status changes or notifications, but it's not suitable for kind of two-way communication. Then looking at WebSocket, so this works by having a persistent full duplex connection between a client and server, and so both can send and receive messages in real time to each other. The pros include it's real time, it's bi-directional communication, and it's ideal for tracking kind of driver's locations as well as allowing instantaneous updates, um, and it's low latency once that connection is established. And um, the cons include that it requires more resources and scaling can be complex, you know, especially if we're gonna be handling thousands of concurrent connections. And it's best for kind of continuous location updates, real time notifications, and kind of ride tracking features. And then quick, so this is quick UDP internet connections. So how this works is it is a transport protocol that provides a faster connection establishment and data transfer over HTTP3. It's reliable, secure, and it's built on top of UDP. The pros include that it's got lower latency than WebSockets due to faster connection setup. And it also has multiplexing with, uh, without head of line blocking, making it more efficient. And the cons, however, include that it's a newer technology and so it's less supported than WebSockets. And so it can be complex to implement and debug. And so it is best for kind of applications requiring faster connections and resilience against packet loss, something like ride tracking. And so while Uber does use Quick um, in their production environment due to its superior performance under varying network conditions, it's a topic they delve into in their engineering blog, which I've linked below. Uh, in this system design, we're gonna use WebSockets. And the reason for that is because in an interview setting, because they're widely understood, it's easy to implement and effective to demonstrate the key concepts of real-time kind of bi-directional communication necessary for a ride-sharing applications, you know, kind of driver location updates. And so if you wanna learn more about these techniques, I'll link a video down below where I dive deeper into all four of those techniques. So back to the driver location update flow. So a driver will first connect to the uh, API gateway. The gateway will then establish a connection with the driver WebSocket server. And then what will happen is the driver WebSocket server will then receive location updates periodically. So maybe every 10 or 15 seconds from the driver app, and it will then send that on to the location queue. And so the driver WebSocket server are scaled horizontally to handle kind of a large number of concurrent connections. And so then it's the location service then that will then pull those notifications off the location queue. And so the next topic we need to dive deeper into is kind of geospatial indexing techniques. And so these are ways in which we are going to be able to identify drivers that are kind of near riders. And so we're going to look at three techniques. The first is geohashing. So this basically encodes latitude and longitude into a short alphanumeric string. And so it's got this grid system. So it divides the world into a grid of cells, enabling proximity searches. And the longer this, the string, the more granular the search becomes. And so the pros include that it's very simple to implement. It's good for a rectangular area queries, but the cons include there's varying cell sizes at different latitudes due to the Earth's curvature. Quad trees is another approach. And so it's a hierarchical tree structure dividing space into four quadrants recursively. And the pros of this include it's efficient for dynamic data, and it's also adaptable to varying data densities, which would be very useful if you think about, you know, a city like New York could have a lot of riders and drivers trying to match, whereas maybe in rural areas, there isn't as much. However, cons include it's more complex implementation, and it can be less efficient for large data sets. And then the final one is H3 indexing. And so this is Uber's hexagonal hierarchical spatial index. And so it uses hexagonal tiling for better spatial uniformity. The pros include it re reduces distortion and it's efficient for K nearest neighbors queries. However, the cons include it's more complex and may require additional effort to integrate. Uh, and so for this system design, I think it's good to show the interviewer an awareness of all three. And if you want to dive deeper into H3 indexing, I think that could be very worthwhile. But for this system design, we're going to stick with geohashing for its simplicity and sufficient performance for our application needs. So back to the driver location update flow. So again, the location service pulled the message off the queue and it will convert the GPS coordinates to a geohashes and then update the location cache. And so this could be an in-memory data source of so something like Redis with geospatial indexing for fast data access. And then we could also have ex expiration policies uh, to remove inactive drivers from the location cache. And so this flow is crucial because we want to know where all our drivers are and be able to store that data in an efficient manner such that when our riders start trying to match that we're only choosing drivers that are nearby. So the next flow we're going to look at is the user ride request flow. So the rider will open the ride sharing app on their mobile device and then the app will then initiate a 
connection to the ride websocket server via the api gateway and so this gateway will help establish this connection to the rider websocket service which will enable real-time communication for updates like ride status changes and driver location tracking and so the gateway will also perform authentication authorization and implement rate limiting and so when the rider connects to the rider websocket service it'll then subscribe to a specific topic in a message broker for example this could be implemented with something like kafka that is associated with that rider. So you could use a hash of the rider ID to create a, a unique and secure topic name, and this could facilitate the delivery of personalized real-time notifications to that rider, such as ride acceptance by a driver. So the rider could then send a post request with their pickup and destination locations to the API fares estimate endpoint in the ride service via the API gateway to get a list of all the fares for kind of different price points. So it could be economy, Uber XL. And so this could then utilize a third party mapping service like Google Maps or Mapbox to generate the best route between um, the pickup and destination locations. And so the fares could then be calculated for different rides, like, like as I said, Uber Economy, XL, based on several factors, including distance, time, traffic conditions, demand factors, you know, dynamic search pricing, and then it could then store it in a database. And so here an SQL database like PostgreSQL could be a good option as it supports ACID principles. So atomicity, consistency, isolation, durability, uh, to ensure that transactions are processed reliably, which is crucial for financial operations like kind of fare calculations and ride status updates. And so the user will then be presented with the available uh, fare options. And then when a rider selects a preferred fare, uh, that'll then send a post request to the APA rides request endpoint to the ride service which will then create a new ride entry in the database with the status created. And you can also implement some optimistic or pessimistic locking in the database to prevent duplicate ride entries or conflicting updates during high traffic. A message can then be sent to the driver assignment queue for processing, and this queue decouples ride creation from driver assignment, which will improve the reliability and kind of scalability of our system. So the driver assignment service will then uh, pull messages from the driver assignment queue, and it will then use geohashing to convert the rider's uh, pick up uh, coordinates into a geohash, which again is a hierarchical spatial data structure that encodes geographic locations into a short alphanumeric string. So we'll then use the geohash prefix to find drivers in the immediate vicinity. And so we can quickly narrow down potential drivers by searching within a specific geohash cell. And if there aren't enough drivers found, it can then expand the search to neighboring geohashes and it can continue this process until a sufficient number of candidate drivers are identified. And so drivers are prioritized using a scoring algorithm, maybe based on factors such as proximity to rider, vehicle type, compatibility, driver status, etc. And then we could also use a distributed lock. So something like a Redis based lock to ensure that ride request is offered to one driver at a time to prevent multiple drivers from accepting the same ride. And so it'll send a ride request to the highest priority driver first. So then we could utilize a notification service to send push notifications like you know, Firebase Cloud Messenger for Android or Apple push notification service for iOS. And we could set a timeout of maybe 15 seconds for the driver to respond. So if the driver accepted, the ride status is updated accordingly. If not, uh, if there's no response or it's declined, we could then release the lock and proceed to notify the next driver on the list and then repeat that process until the ride is accepted or the list is exhausted. And so again, locking is used here to ensure that at any given time, only one driver holds the lock for the ride request so that we don't get multiple drivers accepting the same ride. So when a driver accepts a ride, this will then send a put request to the ride service to confirm acceptance of the ride. The request includes the driver's JSON web token uh, in their authorization header, which contains the driver's ID and other authentication claims. And this ensures that only you know, authenticated drivers can accept uh, ride requests. We can then update the ride status in the database from created to accepted, and then perform the update as an atomic transaction to prevent race conditions and ensure data integrity. And then the ride service can then create a message which includes you know, that the driver has accepted the ride and include the driver's name, profile picture, vehicle information, and estimated time of arrival. And so the, the rider ID is included in the response from the database update, allowing the ride service to then construct the rider's Kafka topic using that secure method of hashing the rider ID. The rider WebSocket service is already subscribed to the rider's topic in Kafka, which was established when the rider app connected and authenticated. And so this persistent WebSocket connection is then used to send that notification to the the writer's app in real time. So here's the complete architecture. I hope it kind of makes a lot more sense 
sense here. I like having it in one picture so you can have this mental snapshot so that whenever you go into an interview, you kind of have this mental image that you can kind of trace about. Um, you might need to listen to it once or twice, but hopefully when you go through it again, it should make sense. And so hopefully we'll have gone into enough depth so that regardless of what your interviewer throws at you, you should be able to handle kind of any of their main questions and be able to nail that interview. So in terms of additional discussion points, you could talk about scaling. So you could talk about scaling the location Redis cluster. So you could use Redis cluster to partition data by region or driver ID and set up master replica configurations with Redis Centennial for failover. Then there's also scaling the Postgres database you know, for read scaling. You could implement read replicas and load balancing for read operations. And then for write scaling, you know, maybe use partition, partitioning or sharding um, as a viable option. And then you could also scale the WebSocket servers using sticky sessions or TCP level load balancing, um, and then maybe optimize resource usage and implement heartbeat mechanisms to ensure proper connection management. And then in terms of security, you know, for authentication and authorization, you could use token-based authentication, you know, JWTs, and enforce role-based access control. And then for data encryption, you could encrypt data in transit using TLS and SSL, and that rest in the databases as well. And then for monitoring and logging, you know, if you think about system monitoring, you could use tools like Prometheus and Grafana for real-time metrics, CPU memory and latency, as well as like implement health checks and application monitoring tools to monitor server performance. And then finally, you could have a centralized logging system. So aggregate logs with the ELK stack or Greylog, and maybe employ structured logging, for example, using JSON and set up alerts for critical events. So hopefully you got some use out of this. If you want to see the full write-up, it's over at techprep.app. And if you could like and subscribe and share it with a friend, if you got any use out of it, it helps the channel out a lot. And hopefully I will see you in the next one.